Welcome to ELT in Chile, a podcast about teaching English in Chile and now teaching online. I'm Daniel Gwynn. I'm Jose Luis Poblete, and this, this is a video episode. If you're listening to this episode, you can watch it on our website, www.eltinchile.com, and also on our YouTube channel that you can also find on our website. Today, we have a very special guest, Barbara Eckhart. So Barbara is a cert- Hello, Barbara. So Barbara is a certified EFL teacher from Universidad Católica Sil Enriquez. So she holds a master's in education, second language education from the University of Toronto, Canada. She recently obtained a certification in teaching Spanish as a foreign language. Nowadays, she's a lecturer of English language at Universidad de Chile, and she teaches uh, second and foreign language learning and teaching methodology at Universidad de Desarrollo and also at Universidad Diego Bortales. Her experience includes developing projects for public and private schools, as well as collaboration with the English Open Stores Program at the Ministry of Education. So her interests are research, language acquisition, assessment, and socio-emotional skills in pre-service teachers. Welcome, Barbara. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you for having Hello. me. Thank Super you for to that. be here. Very good. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Yes. My pleasure. So to start out, um, I was wondering, Could you tell us about how you started learning English? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a funny story. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I am a late learner, like the kind of people who did not learn uh, in immersion, <laughs> right? not at all, no playgroup, no whatsoever, just a regular Chilean public uh, slash private system. So I'm a kind of, I, I just learned at university. Although in high school, I do remember that I could pick up some words and some expressions from music. And this is probably something that many people do. But I remember that I had, you know, like, uh, um, because my mom was uh, a fan of European bands and she would listen to AHA, Duran Duran and stuff. And then later on, when I was a teenager, I remember uh, I listened to bands like, uh, I don't know, American bands. I would listen to Korn, for example. That's and uh, I actually have a funny story. Uh, one of my aunts, uh, one of my aunt, yeah, my aunt, uh, she was living in Canada, but she was like an immigrant, like a recent immigrant in Canada as an adult. But she was like the, the English language reference in the family, right? <laughs> so uh, she visited Chile once uh, in a summer, I remember. And I just got the cassette. Sorry about the time <laughs> period that I'm referring to. <laughs> so like I had corn cassette and I couldn't get the lyrics, right? Because I just got like a few words or, or from the title, but I, I had no idea what I was singing. And she came here and I invited her home and I said, look, uh, this is my favorite song. And I played it. And she was like listening, like, what are you listening to? Like, this is awful. <laughs> But I still love the band, whatever. <laughs> But I remember that that's how I knew, like, oh, you know what? It, it's important to see um, and to know what we're singing. So maybe yeah. I should get into this a little bit more. So I always started, in a way, um, approaching the English language learning through music because I loved music. And then later on, uh, TV shows. Thank God they were TV shows that I could watch uh, and they were in English. Um, so we could learn. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm not the only one who learned English watching Friends, for example. <laughs> no, oh, okay. oh, no, you know, like Daniel Pro is very happy about that, right, Daniel? I love Friends. <laughs> I was See? just thinking of Smelly Cat earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite show. So yeah, and I watched it. I didn't, I didn't mind if they put the same episode over and over. I'll still enjoy it. Mm. And then now that uh, we're grown up <laughs> on grown ups and uh I, i saw that they uploaded the show into the platform that i took my son he's a teenager and i said listen this is how i learned english and i want you to practice watching the same two show <laughs> <laughs> he watched the entire show as well so that's basically how i learned i think um yeah when, when you don't have the resources to learn in an academic context you mm -hmm. usually just pick it up from whatever you have access to So yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, very good. I mean, some some of our previous guests have talked about friends. Some of them have talked about music, of course. They, some yeah. of them have, have talked about video games, books. You know, so I think it's been a different experience for everybody. You know, so like, and also let's say it's kind of funny to see that students have now access to so much information online. Let's say from YouTube, or if they want to listen to podcasts, or if you if they want to, you know, check videos online. I don't know if you have anything to add, Daniel. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think that you make a really good point that there are so many resources now, and I can relate to the thing with the cassettes. Um, <laughs> yeah, me you know, too. and I remember having cassettes and not knowing the lyrics of songs and things. You know, yeah. so um, yeah, and I mean, it is wonderful with all the resources that are available now for kids to learn other languages. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can just go into YouTube and say, "Yeah, I'm looking for I don't know, present perfect," and then you just find tons of videos that talk about that. Maybe teachers explaining that or presentations. So yeah, that's a very good. Yeah, very, very, well, yeah. I remember in the past we kind of depended entirely upon our school. Uh, or whatever, whenever we were or in the surroundings, like in my case, there were everybody spoke Spanish, like I, 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 except for that part of my family who traveled there, but we couldn't really talk to them uh -huh. uh, unless they spoke fluent Spanish. So it was really fun. But I think that um, that's uh, an experience that maybe most people can relate to because yeah. it's true that we kind of depend on whatever's available. And nowadays, yeah, um, yeah the media provides lots of input. Absolutely. So we have the chance to pick it up uh in a more naturalistic way yeah, so yeah that's fantastic but i still remember cassettes vhs uh, <laughs> yeah. anime without subtitles in spanish so you had to learn some english so that you can see what's going on exactly movies, yes. et cetera. absolutely yeah. yeah so barbara talking about that let's say you were of course the the idea of learning english as a as a second language as a foreign language for us what about what was your experience like learning how to teach english now can you tell us about that learning how to teach. Okay, first of all, I am obsessed with the topic of learning and I'll explain how I got into that in particular. I know that some people get obsessed with other, like language itself, but I was, uh, I, 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 it was not the same path for me. I remember, uh, and this is a, a story before, like uh, the origin story. <laughs> I, I used to study science before when I first, um, um, graduated from high school i entered physics actually mm -hmm. oh, so wow. I entered physics in university and i did a year and i loved i love science i still love science and i still love physics and i have had the chance to work with projects related to science but i remember that when i was doing my first year at university it's hard for everybody whatever whatever uh but then i failed one course okay so i failed one very important course and I was super frustrated, but the cool thing is that one of the teachers said, you know what, we are opening a summer course that you can come here and study uh, all over again and get, you know, a remedial kind of test and you can pass the course. It's the last chance. Okay, fantastic. And I said, I'll take it, of course. So I spent my entire summer uh, trying to relearn what I had to pending. But the funny thing is that I remember the teacher came and said, you know what, why don't you guys study from these manuals that I just got from the library? They were new and they were in English, mm. you know, so it was physics oh and English with the diagrams, you know, and they were uh, explaining things like torque and, you know, like uh, uh, work and all this stuff. So, OK, now um i failed it <laughs> i failed the subject and i have to study it in english <laughs> i don't know what's going to happen so but i remember having so much fun trying to figure out how to translate the manual into spanish then then i realized you know what okay i passed the course by the way <laughs> i mean finally i passed it. very good <laughs> yeah, i made it but what i mean is that um that's how i realized you know what i have much more fun trying to figure out things from one language to the other um than i do like in in in, in the subject of science so i decided to switch careers so uh i passed my course i closed my year i talked to my family and i moved on to um teaching english and that was great because um when i entered this place i entered with the uh in a way with the spirit of i'm going to learn um english and then i'm going to be able to provide the opportunity for other people to learn but i was not really aware of what learning entailed and i remember for me it was mind-blowing when I started like re real, uh, like uh, when you when you study pedagogy and you're that young mm -hmm. and and there are so many beliefs that change in, in your brain, because I really believed in things that we as educators know that are not true. For example, we understand that sometimes a, a student uh, achievement depends on how much opportunities that person has instead of um, you know, inner talent, which is a part of it, of course, but not all of them. You know? uh, also, 
things like, oh, you're too old to learn English now. Mm. I was super scared because I was like a uh, university age and uh, I was, I didn't speak English. Mm. I just got this experience of translating one manual and that's it. So I felt like maybe I'm going to be at a disadvantage. But the cool thing was that uh, over there, I could learn a university. And also the, uh, uh, the focus of the university where I studied was to be like helping people, you know, and improving conditions for learning and bringing more and more opportunities. So it was really cool for me to understand that. And that's how I became obsessed with what's going on in people's mind when they are learning, <laughs> like how you make connections, how much it depends on the things you have experienced before and how much it depends on the opportunities you have to try new things around you. And also, uh, how much uh, learning depends on how you feel emotionally. Mm. Yeah. So for me, it was like a great opportunity. When I studied pedagogy, uh, I didn't really get the, the, uh, the calling, <laughs> but I actually <laughs> developed it while I was studying because discovering this was amazing. So yeah, I'm always I always go back to that those times in my mind and I remember how uh, I felt that every day was a discovery journey and I was mm. like like super um excited about that like with everything. So yeah, that that's how it is. And also, if you learn another language, one thing is learning pedagogy, right? Because it gives you this broad idea on how people learn. Um but then learning another language opens up this new culture that I didn't have access to, right? Mm -hmm. So now I could watch movies and understand the jokes. Uh, now I could uh, get my, my TV shows and understand again um, the beliefs, you know, the way that people lived and all these cultural aspects that you probably miss when you don't really uh, understand the language. So it was a double discovery. For, I remember those years with the yeah, with lots of love. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> very, of that. very good. I think yeah, you make let's say some 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 very good points, Barbara. You know, like the idea of of course, like for some people, teachers are not born, but they are made. You know, like you can become a exactly. teacher. And like, let's say through through like, experience, basically, like when you how you actually how you learn how to be a good teacher through teaching. You know, guidance, of course, learning and studying. But I think it's basically through experiences. You know. Yeah, and I find that really interesting that you made that transition from science over to English. And, you know, just that the circumstances of those manuals being available <laughs> in English was the thing that put you on the path to yeah. become an English teacher. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, it, and it depends. And it's funny if you think about it, if the teacher, if I hadn't fail that course i'll probably be somewhere else right now <laughs> right uh -huh. so it's interesting to think about failure in that way so i tried to look at those years like yeah but it got me to this path and i'm happy now so i always try to tell that to my students who are at university like sometimes they are so frustrated nowadays um, they are under so much pressure into being perfect and getting the standards yeah. you know and everyone is kind of used to have the same path of starting one year and finishing the exact year that you're supposed to instead of just enjoying the ride. But I understand that mm. it's because not everyone can pay to stay a lot. Like in my case, yeah. uh, I was paying for my own education. So yeah, I could afford to it. But uh, nowadays it's different, but still the idea is like, uh, enjoy the ride, you know, uh, this is mm -hmm. a journey, a journey to discover yourself. You're growing as a professional, as a person. So yeah, I think we need to take it slow sometimes when it when it's necessary and when we can. Um, yeah. yeah, that's what I think. I, I, that definitely resonates with me of everyone having very high expectations of themselves. They want to get good grades. They want to be, you know, working in their field. They want to have a job right after graduating. And unfortunately, life doesn't always work out that way. But as you said, I think it does lead us on the right path. It might just take some time to get there. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Excellent. So I have a, a question for you. So you've been the president of TESOL Chile for a few years now. And so I think part of that time has been not during the pandemic and part of that time has been during the pandemic. So I was wondering what that experience has been like. Oh, oh, great question. Yes. Um, well, I've been president of TESOL Chile now for two years only. I got uh, elected by my colleagues. Super happy. But before that, uh, I was vice president. So I only have like two periods. Uh, we have periods of two years in, in the, uh, according to the rules, right? 
So, um, yes, when I was vice president, I was part of the, uh, a fantastic team uh, with Camilo Ramos. And I remember that uh, we got the challenge of the main challenge was basically the social uh, outburst that we had. So that was the thing that we that we got to live and how to, um, you know, how to build up, how to uh, organize a conference when we're uh, in a time where people were scared of coming to Santiago sometimes because we were like, uh, it was not safe for them. People were, uh, some people who are not from Santiago, uh, from abroad, for example, were looking at the news uh, watching the news and telling us, is it safe for me to travel there? So, you know, and uh, also they, the, the way, the way they, um, we were, we were deciding, do we have to do a conference or not? And that was the challenge back then when I was vice president. And and finally we, we decided to do it because we thought like we have to open a, a place to speak and to talk about what's going on. Right. Cause it's important. And, uh, and we were feeling that this topic was going to be something because our teachers, they keep in touch with us. Uh, most of the, uh, the team, the board back then, we were um, practicum supervisors. So we got to go to schools and see how mm. things were going on. And you get to listen to teachers, right? Uh, and to students who are teaching at schools and they see different realities. So yeah, something was going on. We needed to talk about social justice we decided to do uh, the conference um, about that. And we did a cabildo as well for teachers and teacher educators so that we could um, have voices heard. And it was interesting to have that place just to talk about things, you know, because we haven't done that. Um, so yeah, that was the, the challenge back there. And then when I was elected president, as soon, even before the new team, could meet for the first time in an official meeting, we got the pandemic and quarantine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <laughs> we have actually met online only. So we are a team of five people. Uh, first time we met each other or we have met before, but we this is the first time we work together and we have done everything online. So if you ask me about challenges, I'll tell you, well, the challenges, I don't know how they look like. <laughs> 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 except from the faces you know, and the way I can hear them, you know, um, but it's amazing. Um, although that was a challenge and the challenge of organizing things, uh, we decided to switch things to online so that people could have uh, opportunities to share the knowledge. We could see that at the beginning in 2020, uh, we decided not to go with the, with the regular conference that we usually do. And we decided also to, in a way, suspend whatever fee people had to pay because mm -hmm. it was not uh, it was not sensible to do that. And we felt that, um, and this is a, I, I really I am going to be very responsible saying this, but we felt, <laughs> or I felt, that there were not enough opportunities for training that came from central power. In a way, we were expecting that okay, we're going to go online, so teachers. Here are the resources, here are the courses, here are the webinars or whatever. And we didn't really see that, at least not for <laughs> English teachers, or we didn't see it that much. Yeah. So it felt like it had to come from the community itself. Yeah. And that's how we decided to switch to a series of online webinars of whomever was willing to share concerns or knowledge or skills or the ways that they could in a way improvise and uh, catch up with this challenge. So we opened up the door for that and we had fantastic, we had a panel um, regarding young learners. We had, we invited teachers from actual schools and they were sharing how things were done. Uh, we had you guys, right, sharing <laughs> yeah. some strategies that I am actually yeah. using in my <laughs> classes. <laughs> oh, they were fantastic. Very good, very good. And, yeah. and and that's a that's a cool thing. So yeah, that's kind of the, the yeah the challenges were really tough. But the cool thing is to connect. We were able to connect with people. That that was kind of the positive of, of it's been the positive of this pandemic because it, we're still living this. But I was able to meet um, lots of teachers from places in Chile that I would never seen before. Uh, I was able to, in a way, empower colleagues so that they could have the voice. They could, even if they had to say something in the chat in the conference, or they want to open up their mic, 
and rant about something, yeah, that's the space that could do that, you know, and that was the that was the the place to do it. At least we have a place to do it. And now uh, it had it has become something very interesting because I have met people from across the mountains. I met people from Argentina who wanted to collaborate with us from Peru, and, and it's amazing. And I think if this was face to face in normal conditions. Just because of the cost of traveling, yeah. maybe we wouldn't have been able to have people from Canada, people from Peru, mm -hmm. people from Argentina. So, yeah, I think, yes, it is a struggle. Yes, it is a big challenge, but we also have to be thankful for the things that are actually working and the new connections we have made. So it's basically that. Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you made some, some some really good points, you know, like, of course, the challenges and opportunities that this pandemic has presented. I mean, it's something that we have talked about in our podcast as well. You know, like this is uh, having, let's say, the opportunity to, to talk to other colleagues, you know, connecting with other people from different countries, you know, that maybe, like you said, Barbara, in, in let's say, you know, in our past life, that was much, much more difficult because you had to travel, you know, go to a country that, and that was, let's say, much, much more difficult. And Barbara, I have another, a question for you related to that. How has, has it been difficult to create, let's say, connections or have people been really willing to participate in online events or has it been difficult to find people to maybe to, to collaborate with you? It hasn't been hard, actually. I have to, uh, I have to admit that usually we just uh, make the invitation and we get people who want to uh, get in touch with us. That's how I got to meet some of these people, especially teachers. Uh, sometimes uh, it, it concretes and gets to be a webinar or something like that. Some other times it's like, no, I'm too busy. I'm overwhelmed with the pandemic and we understand. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, the way I see it in, in the conditions we are right now, where we're struggling across the globe, right, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with health, with economy and stuff, I am actually surprised that some people are so motivated that they really want to share. And they sometimes they write to us and they tell us, we have this new book. Uh, I have this technique. I have this strategy that I tried at school. Could I show it? Uh, and we try to open spaces for that. Mm. Although we cannot give like a lot right now, but, but we try and... Uh, and we have received, um, I, I think that the attitude of wanting to share what is working with you, it's amazing professional ethics for me. That's the, the way I see it. So it's not like, oh, this is my, and I'm going to sell it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not yeah. at all. It's more like, I really want to show that this works and I'd like to help more and more people. Yeah. So yeah, it's been really cool in that sense. That's wonderful. I think that sense of community and helping each other out is so important, you know, more now so than ever. Yeah, and also like, yeah, like, and also like, uh, this is also like the idea of our podcast, you know, like sharing, you know, because we get people and also like the, that's why I wanted to ask you about if, if you find, let's say that people are really willing to participate. In our case, it's been like that, you know, like every time we say, hey, would you like to, you know, talk to us or like you or maybe some other colleagues in the past? And they, they say always, yes, of course, like there's something I would like to share or I've been working, let's say this has worked for me or why don't you try this? So let's just share information. I think that's, that's very good. That's that. That's awesome. This is a great community. <laughs> English teaching is a great community. Yeah. yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, Daniel, do you have any other question for for Barbara? Yeah. So, um, in addition to being with Tisol Chile, you've also gone through this pandemic as a teacher, <laughs> yeah. and so I was wondering how your teaching has changed, oh. and what opportunities, what challenges have you experienced while teaching online. Oh, great question. Now it's asking me as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, I, I'd say the biggest challenge at the beginning of the pandemic, if I can think about something that was problematic, was communication. We had these people who kind of, uh, students who got lost, we never saw them. They didn't know how to use uh, the apps. I didn't know how to use the app, so we had to <laughs> learn together, right? Uh, and every platform or everything that the universities were, um, in this case, I have to thank the universities I work with because they were like, here, here's Zoom and here's whatever you need, so please use it. So all I had to do was to learn how to use it instead of acquiring them, mm. but still was a struggle, you know? It, it was still a struggle because, um, yeah, also students were not um, emotionally in the state of mind of let's learn something new. Mm. So my first challenge was communication. How can I bring you back? Maybe I couldn't, so I had to ask for help or someone else. 
And then when I got a group, <laughs> then how do I keep them engaged, right? Mm -hmm. So I need to keep them engaged and, um, and let's try different things. So it's really interesting because it's, it, it transformed the way I teach. Now I have a completely new methodology. I try to use dynamic things. I try to uh, do, you know, short, um, short sections in my class. So even if my class or my lesson will, will, uh, will, will be as long as it used to be when we were face to face, now I try to switch the topic so no one gets uh, falls asleep or that no one feels like disengaged. So I try to keep them here. And I always ask for feedback. That's something else that I'm doing because this is new for everybody. So part of my new methodology is uh, discussing with my students. The, uh, I have the advantage that most of my students are uh, future teachers. So I just, I can come clean with them and tell them, you know, this is what we're trying. I read this paper, I'm trying this new methodology, I'm trying this new strategy, uh, tell me how it works. And they have been fantastic. They always tell me, Miss, this is good. This is not that good. Let's do this more. <laughs> Let's change this other thing. And, and it's pretty cool. And I think so far, um, that's very important to try to keep that community, the community that we had in our classrooms, try to rescue them, you know? because uh, it, it took a while to build it and then suddenly the pandemic destroyed it. Yeah. So uh, my main focus has been in, uh, and I think it's not mine, it's probably our focus. I, I, I'm sure that many colleagues are doing the same. How do I keep this community that I had so that everyone feels at ease and only then can they focus on learning. Mm -hmm. So yeah, another opportunity that I found in the, in the sense of um, what this, uh, uh pandemic situation brings is that we can finally talk about emotions um now we don't have to hide it uh, because it's impossible sometimes because we're overwhelmed or because sometimes yeah. students are uh, so anxious and it's impossible not to be anxious about the future if you see that everything is so uncertain yeah. so I have opened, okay so let's open this time in the class to talk about the way we feel. Uh, how do you do to feel better, like uh, share some strategies. And sometimes they come up with great ideas, like uh, I pet my cat, I pet my dog, <laughs> or uh -huh. I don't know, things like, uh, yes, I like to be here in the computer and I tell my parents to please uh, help me be in, in silence for a while. Other people tell me I cannot do it in, live on class, but I try to watch the recording. And some other people are working, right? Because, um, uh -huh. yeah, situation, right? So but I try to catch up, miss, but as long as, it, as, as long as we keep in touch, we have been able to find ways to stay connected and to make things work uh, as far as uh, it can work <laughs> in this uh, situation. Yeah, but that's basically what we do. And if you allow me, I would like to share something about this emotion uh, thing, dimension that sure. I think has opened. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. That's something sure. I was going to ask you about, but please go okay, ahead. Cool. You, can, you can share that with, with sure, us. Sure, because I'm super excited about this. Like we have just, at Universidad del Desarrollo, we have just uh, finished um, uh, one research about um, socio-emotional skills because we saw that at the beginning of last year, this was an issue, right? So we had our... Um, pre-service teachers or uh, teachers to be uh, struggling with practicum because uh, practicum was either online or they were not seeing students. Maybe yeah. that was the first time and they were like, this is not real teaching. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to see uh, how well they were able to cope with all these overflowing emotions that they were feeling. And uh, so we carried out an investigation throughout the whole year. Uh, we carried out uh, some um, some uh, emotional intelligence tests, and then we also carried out some interviews. We tried to interview like a variety of people, and um, it was really interesting to see how we <laughs> or pre-service teachers, but I am sure that we probably, as cultural, we also might have this kind of um, dual view or maybe contradict, uh, contradicting view of emotions. Because on the one hand, the teacher may feel that we have to hide emotions, right? We have to suppress them. Because if I get angry, people might get um, sad, my students might be affected. Yes, so we try probably to hide uh, emotions. 
But on the other hand, there are other teachers who feel very comfortable sharing the way they feel and using that as a powerful tool. Or sometimes they want to open these uh, spaces for students to talk about their emotions. And that also works. So we found these this, uh, very contradicting beliefs about how to deal with emotions when you are a teacher to be. And what was interesting was that we carried out this investigation during the pandemic in lockdown. So they were teaching online and we were able to ask them, how have you been feeling uh, while teaching online? And that's precious because um, uh, it's interesting to see that some people felt they were safer, you know, that was super interesting. Some people said, yeah, I'm safer because I'm home. Mm. I'm not that exposed. But on the other hand, they were telling us this is not real practicum. So I am still scared of real life face to face students, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting. We had this polarized view. Um, But overall, uh, what I could tell about this uh, investigation um, is that what struck us the most was that everybody felt they were super cool (laughs) at dealing with emotions. Uh, When we asked them to report, they would say like, no, I'm super good at dealing with emotions. I like, no problem. But then if you interview them and you got into that um, detail, (laughs) details, yeah, that's where they admitted like, yes, I need help. I would Mm. like to have help. This is important for me. And that was something great that we, uh, overall, we got that this is important and our students want to get some kind of training in socio-emotional skills because they have to deal with colleagues, fellow teachers, Mm. their supervisors, their students and parents. And all of those things are sources of challenges and stress. So it's a good idea to have the baggage or to have these skills so that you can deal with yourself while dealing with everything else. Um, And we thought this was important because we really want to prevent depression, you know, the burnout uh, uh, syndrome and stuff like that. So I was super happy and proud to participate in this this research. I was a um, co-researcher. The team leader was uh, um, uh, Enrique uh, Solobuden at WDD. He's coordinator of the language uh, language area. So it was really nice to, uh, even if it was not in English, it included uh, English language uh, teachers to be, but it was basically interdisciplinary. So we could see how people in science were feeling, people in history. So overall, we got the same thing. Uh, all our pedagogy students feel like this is important. Socio-emotional skills is an important area to be developed. Uh, and they also, they also feel that um, they want to develop those skills. So they want to get that training. So step two is to see how we can help this. Like uh, we yeah, have that, to learn ourselves. Uh-huh, uh, yeah. yeah. So it's really yeah, the, that that's something I that I yeah yeah. Daniel, go ahead, go ahead, Daniel. I think there's so much to what you said, and I mean, I think one thing is that you know we're not robots. We don't just deliver information and put it into our students' brains. They're not robots. They're humans. They're going through things at home. You know, we're also going through things. So I think the fact that you can open up and you can be vulnerable to your students and say, you know, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm going through. I think that that's a sign of bravery and also, you know, showing your students, look, I'm human too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, that that's a very good point, Daniel. I mean, I was going to ask about that, uh, Barbara, you know, like, what's next, you know, so what, how are you going to deal with that? So, of course, of, it's just like a difficult thing of just like maybe creating, let's say, a class or having the, let's say, the support from, I don't know, psychologists or people who work in those areas. I don't know what, what have you thought about that? Like, what's what would be next for your project? Oh, well, uh, so the cool thing about the team is that it is interdisciplinary, the team itself. So not only the sample of of, uh, uh, students that we interviewed, but we do have a psychologist uh, in our team. And we have uh, also someone expert in evaluations and and measurement so that we can have this mixed method method, uh, thing going on. But the interesting thing was that we had the support of the program. Or, which is a programa de formación profesional at UDD. So without that support, this topic probably wouldn't have flourished in mm. any other place. Uh, um, 
And, and this is the faculties of education are supposed to be the place where these things should flourish. And the cool thing is that you, we have been uh, awarded to continue. So this year we can continue uh, our investigation. We can replicate what we did and we're trying to find ways. So, okay, so now that we know that this is going on and this is a necessity uh, and there's a, some sort of awareness on how important there is, now we need to prepare some plan, but that is still in the making, right? How are we going to do it? Yeah. Are we going to do it like uh, as a particular course? Who should teach that course? It should be an expert. We're just learning, right? So yeah. it's new for everybody. And then maybe not a course, maybe we will implement it in the programs. Because also that was part of very interesting part of the research that we did is that we not only interviewed the students, we also interviewed the programs, right? So we had, we scrutinized uh, the documents. And if you see a graduation profile, how much of socio-emotional skills are being weighted? Prison, yeah. You know, how much does this uh, program care about this? And usually they all care about it, but it doesn't get to be written explicitly, mm. right? Uh, and this is probably cultural. We're focusing on academics and we're focusing yeah, on- Performance maybe. Yeah. Great. But I think we still have this new thing to explore. Uh -huh. and include as well yeah and i mean i think one issue with this also is that i think that governments are so focused on standardized test scores how they're doing compared to other countries you know and they're really looking at these hard numbers math science reading but you know like i said before we aren't machines we aren't robots you know so we have to learn to deal with our emotions too and i think that that's a change that has to happen but i think it's going to take some time yeah, absolutely. But I think this is also a great opportunity, Barbara. I mean, when when there is like uh, there is that area does not exist, you have the chance to create something new, you know, so you have a chance to experiment as well, you know, so being like a sort of pioneer, you know, so you can get to experiment and say, okay, how can we, let's say, tra transform this into something that's, you know, beneficial for 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 everybody. And and yeah, and Barbara talking about, let's say, TESOL, TESOL chill a little bit. What are you, can you talk about the let's say Tizo Tizo Chile's future plans in terms of events, webinars, conferences, or research? Is there anything like happening there? Like you know, are you thinking of some other events or maybe uh, having let's say a collection of resources? I don't know some papers or books or I don't know what do you have in, in mind for 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 the rest of the year. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we are a very motivated team. We have many <laughs> ideas and things we want to do and plans, but uh, we can only do uh, so much. So we have focused this year on uh, preparing a series of webinars throughout the year. And in this moment, we are in the process of organizing uh, the webinars that are going to be taking uh, place during the year and contacting the presenters so that we can, in a way, um, uh, schedule when it will be great for everybody. But we, we, don't, we decided not to do this virtual conference kind of thing because we're guessing that not everybody might be available at one particular time. And because we cannot bet about the future anymore, not this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's better to have, you know, like uh, we, we yeah. want to have something new every month so uh, that, that, that teachers can say, oh, that's the month that, because I'm interested in that topic. So I'm going to connect that month and not the next one because I don't care about the other thing. Now, the idea is that so the teachers can cater uh, themselves, you know, with our uh, with our program. So that's what we're planning. So, but the things we have planned for uh, for these years are webinars, panels, and teaching tip videos. So we're going to we have opened the chance and we have received some proposals of um, our real teachers at school that will share some strategy that is working for them during the pandemic. Very so good. in usually Wonderful. in online teaching. So uh, I think that's going to be very valuable. We want to also um, continue with our interviews. We want to have more interviews, uh, interviewing more teachers so that we can get to know each other in the community and see if this is just an exercise so that you can reflect uh, on that you're not alone with this challenge. You're probably, there's probably a colleague at the other side of the country, maybe in the very bottom of the South of Chile or in the North in the desert, that's dealing with the same thing we are doing in somewhere else. And also because we really want to get, I am really excited in getting to know teachers outside Santiago as well, yeah. right? So it could be here, that's but important. I would like to see how other uh, other regions are doing because there's, the, the, there's a lot of uh, professional uh, teaching knowledge that is acquired in the field, like 
calle, <laughs> I would say yeah. in Chile, uh -huh. that it would be great to share, right? Uh, to be shared. So yeah, we're also looking forward to it. But yeah, you have to stay tuned, guys. Uh, but let me just uh, <laughs> let me just say that uh, in May everything begins. That's okay. all I can say. Uh, so, oh, very good. Uh, we like surprises, so <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah, and I really, I really like the point you made that there's so much amazing work that's already happening in schools with teachers. And I mean, I think this is the thing too. There are so many webinars out there. There are so many amazing people that it's hard to keep up with everything. You know, and it's wonderful that organizations are publishing these things. They're organizing webinars, panels, talks, and all those things. And that's really helping everyone. Yeah. So give it a good so, Yeah, Daniel. I actually had um, another question. And so if there's a teacher that is just starting out teaching now, okay. what advice would you give that teacher or those oh. teachers? Novice teacher. Oh my God. <laughs> like, uh, let's talk to uh, ourselves back back in the day. Uh, yeah, well, um, I think I have like two, two things that I usually tell my students uh, when we are getting close to the last, the final years of the program and they are kind of ready to graduate. Uh, uh, I try to remind them, but this is, of course, it comes from my experience in, in classrooms. But the first thing is that everybody has to have in mind is that remember that not everything you teach, people will learn. Because mm -hmm. learning and, teacher, and teaching are two different phenomena. Yeah, think, yeah. you know? So I try to so keep that in mind. So don't get frustrated if you feel that you teach something over and over and it, it's some it, it's somehow not going through try a different method uh, all we can do is provide carefully designed experiences so that learning happens but we cannot pretend to vomit knowledge on someone else right they are not empty boxes i'm not filling them with anything right yeah. but mostly like so design an experience that's the, that's the way i always uh, i i try to put it design experiences right so um this is not a lecture not a presentation it usually doesn't work design more an experience of people doing th things and experiencing things those are the uh, the processes that make uh, learning happen mm -hmm. so don't get frustrated if it doesn't just change the way you're doing things and try 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 you know, that's the first thing I would say. And a second, of course, I'm going to defend my super uh, favorite uh, topic of research, uh, socio-emotional skills, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> of course, just to remind people that emotions uh, do belong to the classroom as well. They don't have to be outside the door, as we usually tell ourselves. Like, we're not entertainers. Uh, we're professionals and we what we do is based on science right we what we do is based on uh research we study uh the data we study the evidence in order to make decisions so trust your decisions and one of them uh, is to incorporate emotions you know that that works for your students why are you not treating yourself the same way if you already know <laughs> that those things are important don't leave them outside the door feed feed yourself from emotions, experience the emotions that you're feeling right now, and then start again if something if something goes wrong, but just don't don't leave them outside the classroom. Those will be my two things that don't forget these two things that are very important to me at least. <laughs> very humbling. <laughs> oh, they are, they are. I mean, emotions, of course, are, are very important. And, you know, we always, talk, we, we always, let's say, talk about emotions, let's say, when we ask our students, how are they feeling? But it's kind of funny when they ask you, and teacher, how are you feeling? You know, <laughs> then you're like, oh, that's a very difficult question for me to answer. So I have to really think, it's like, you know, I, this is the way I feel. So this, it's been also a complex year for me, like for everybody, you know, so it's kind of difficult yeah, yeah. to answer that question. Yeah, it's just to remember, like the same thing you guys said, like 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 Daniel was saying, we're human, we're not robots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we can model that to our students, we can even help them develop their own socio emotional skills. If they can see that today I'm tired, guys, but I'm trying my best. Oh, so that's the way you should act when you're an adult and you're tired, not like yeah. ranting, yeah. you know, and screaming at children. It's yeah. <laughs> just normal, right? Or saying so, that everything is all right when not, not everything is all right. Yeah, exactly. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, not being in denial, right? Like showing that, oh, these things happen and they, yeah. uh, we, we're all sad when something bad happens and that's natural. So, yeah, um, yeah that's part of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that makes me talking about friends. That makes me think of the episodes when everyone was running late 
And so Ross had this really, really big event and no one was really taking it seriously. And Rachel was having a difficult time deciding what to wear. And he got so frustrated, he started yelling at her, I don't care what you're wearing, just go ahead, get in there, get dressed, and let's go. <laughs> and, walks away and she says, okay. And then she changes, for anyone that hasn't seen it, she then changes into a sweatshirt and pajama pants. And then she casually walks over and she sits down. And Ross says, um, you know, this is a little bit casual. He says, you know, I'm not going to go. He says, you know, oh, you're not going? No. And he says, you're mad. No, I'm not <laughs> mad. I'm just not going. <laughs> that is, I think, the perfect example of, you know, the way you right. not as <laughs> exactly. a mature adult. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, those I am uh yeah, those are not the examples that we want for our children right now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Young people. laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And Barbara, I have another question for you. Do you have any specific resources that you would recommend to teachers? Maybe I don't know, uh, uh an, an app that you're using, maybe I don't know, a book or a software that you're using or anything that you can recommend? Oh, that's tough. I am not particularly good at this. Like I have uh, colleagues who are like so good at apps and stuff, but I am usually the last one to to uh, to know that. Oh, okay, that's a new app, and everybody's using it. So, um, or even a book, it, have, like, it, or you can yeah, be a book, like a book, or a book, yeah, you know? a whole book. Uh, many books, but I, I just don't want to sound like I'm advertising something, but I <laughs> would really <laughs> like, okay. like personally, I really like Cengage Nagio Na books, uh -huh. like the National Geographic series. I have seen some series and I really like the topics and they talk about culture and stuff. But having said that, when I teach, I try to prefer um, local stuff. So I try to look for videos that are more local, mm -hmm. but uh, or uh, because I usually teach uh, listening and speaking. But when I teach methodology, I try to bring examples from Latin America, like what's going on in Colombia, what's going on in Chile, how is Ar Argentina doing something, and it's mm -hmm. interesting, especially for uh, when we are um, for teacher educators, for example. I try to bring local things because, of course, we have to read the other uh, European westernized world <laughs> yeah. uh, literature. I try to mix it a little bit, but uh, yeah. But in my day to day classes, uh, what I use is like I I use YouTube all so much, like mm. all so mm. much. Uh, in my account, I have I, I even have playlists of YouTube, and I uh, you classify them by topics. So if I ever teach another course again about this topic, I know that I have to go there, and I have Do a of things that sound good and it's easy and it's for free you know and i can share my yeah. screen and and because uh we might not be content creators but there are many good content creators in the world and i think that what i like about youtube is that those are um it, it could be anybody placing their point of view about something instead of the official you know super peer-reviewed which is good but i think we should complement So what's going on uh, around? So, yeah, and you can find many teachers sharing stuff on YouTube from all over the world. Yeah. So that would be my favorite app. That oh, would be my good. favorite. There you go. Very good. Very good. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. And I think point that's out. a really good point, too, because, um, I mean, the thing is, I think textbooks can be a really, really good resource. They can be a good starting point. But um, I remember when I was teaching at a university, um, one of the units, one of the first units they had was going on and going to the airport and going on a plane, you know, and checking in baggage and all these things. But they said, realistically, how many of the students here are, have actually ever been to an airport? Yeah. So what the university did was they took that unit and they adapted it to going to the bus station exactly. and traveling by bus because that was something that their students could relate to. And so I think that that's a great point that you make, you know, making it relevant for your students in their context. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I think we just have one more question, the most important question here. Okay. Daniel, I think Daniel is going to yes. ask. Him. <laughs> so this could make or break your career. Oh, my God. <laughs> Does pineapple belong on pizza? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Of course it does. Like I don't know. <laughs> very good. Very good. Very good. And not only on pizza, you could put it everywhere. Oh, oh my gosh. I will go more radical. 
<laughs> I will be more radical than you guys, and I will just put it everywhere. I actually have two pineapples waiting for me in my kitchen right now. <laughs> <laughs> that level of that to level add, to, of add, advocacy. To, to add them to to your cazuela. <laughs> yeah, probably. That's a good idea. I had to try, probably try it and let you know. <laughs> okay yeah very good thank you very Look much uh, yeah so that's it for this episode of ELT in Chile thank you Barbara for being our guest today it was a super helpful you know uh, interview you made some really good points and of course we really like to find out what happens you know with, with your project in the future because it sounds and say very interesting well thank you guys for having me and I would love to uh, come back and tell you how things work um, <laughs> yeah let's hope it works okay uh, and yeah no thank you for the opportunity to to share this and uh, and, and to invite people Tiso <laughs> we are uh -huh. doing things for you guys so uh, come and check them uh, good quality presentations are coming up as well of course yeah and if, if there's something that you would like to share with us you can share I mean we can share them for you if you want mm -hmm. I mean we, we can also use our platforms to to share your information no problem and in a way we, we can also uh, help each other right thank you that would yeah. be fantastic yeah so if you haven't already you can follow us on Spotify subscribe on YouTube like on our Facebook page of course like our Facebook page or leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, right so all of those things help the podcast grow and continue what we are doing and have let's say these high quality guests Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Barbara. And if anyone listening or watching has any questions or comments, you can reach us at podcast at eltnchile.com. Thank you for listening, everyone. Stay safe, stay kind, and of course, keep on teaching. Keep on teaching. <laughs>